Hello and welcome to Rock the Cash Box. This talk is about hands-on ATM protocol analysis and we'll be covering ATMs and of course the protocols that power them. It's at least one specific protocol. This talk has been made specifically for DEF CON 30 and Retail Hacking Village. I hope that for those of you who have not been at Hacker Summer Camp in some time, this will be a good uh, refresher on ATMs. And if you're new to security and you want to know how ATMs work or you want to look at protocol analysis, this talk should and is tailored for you. I really wanted to focus on the basics and how protocols work. So with that, enough about the introduction. You really aren't here to just hear about the talk. You want to actually see it. So let's get started. So about me, I am Wasabi, sometimes spicy, at least on Twitter, and I am a perpetual volunteer. That's how this whole event started, and that's how I get a lot of interesting ideas and work for um, some of the research I do. Uh, the events that I help put on are the Collegiate Pen Testing Competition, the Global Collegiate Pen Testing Competition. My apologies. It's a very awesome competition, which is how we got to this. Uh, in this particular year, they were tasked with pen testing a bank. And I also participate in the Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition, which is the cyber defense aspect of that. These events are very interesting, and if you're a student, you should definitely look into getting involved. I am a researcher of embedded devices. I have researched voting machines, ATMs, of course, and many routers and other devices of an embedded nature. The great thing about embedded devices is there's always something new, and you may think, oh, this device is secure and it's fully updated. Nope, never is. So it's a very interesting topic, and I can go on and on about all the embedded devices that are out there today. This includes the Internet of Things, but we're really focusing on ATMs, and these ATMs specifically are quite old, So, uh, but they're still in use. So it, it should be an interesting rediscovery for um, everyone. Now, I will be sitting in the audience probably that way, and if you happen to see me, please ask questions. I know that this is a little weird. I was not either expecting to be doing a in-person talk via recording. But here we are, and I'm grateful for this opportunity because, for one, everyone's going to be wearing masks, and two, this gives me an opportunity to make sure that all the content and demo and videos are all working as expected because if anyone's ever done a talk before, you know things go sideways. Anyway, finally, I am a cloud engineer by day, so none of the stuff we're talking about really is my day job, but if you are interested in these topics, I'm happy to answer questions or find people who might know or do know the answers to those questions. Now, my partner with this was formerly known as JRWR. He's now going as Balsa, at least on Twitter. Uh, he is the creator and designer of Hatchan. He is working at, with the DEF CON scavenger hunt for some really cool stuff this year. And so you should go check him out. And also he does some really interesting work on some CTFs and things like that. Overall, he is a really good guy to work with. And if you have any questions about so many topics, please go reach out to him. He, he's awesome. Unfortunately, he, I don't think he's going to be here today because, of course, he's running the uh, scavenger hunt. But I um, wanted to give credit where credit's due. And that was the team that helped make this happen. So anyway, um, you're here not to hear about us, of course. You're here about rocking the cash box. And fun fact, if you ever see an ATM do what's in the picture, it's fake. It's, in fact, so fake that you it's been modified. It's tampered with. It's, it's not real. Um, in fact, the ATMs that we're dealing with, that is one of them, uh, they have a guard to prevent money from flying out because as one should with designing an ATM, you probably don't want the money flying out into the air. And of course, what is a cash box? Well, inside of an ATM, you have to get money. Now, unlike a vending machine, you don't want to have the vendors who refill the machines handling the money. They could take some, do all sorts of stuff. So they are handed cash, box with, cash boxes with specific keys. And the machine can pull money out of that cash box. So our goal is to get the money out of the cash box. And how are we going to do that? Well, we're not modifying the ATMs. 
we are not modifying the firmware. We are not doing anything with the ATMs, in fact. The ATMs are stock. We have not customized them, except for maybe a few repairs, because the ones that we got were in pretty bad condition. Um, we think that this talk, at very least, is interesting and unique, because not many people have looked at the protocol. Oh, my headset's falling off. Um, and looked at the protocol that powers a lot of these ATMs. These ATMs are still in use, and so we are specifically talking about that protocol that powers them. And we are bringing ATM protocols, at least one of them, to the masses at DEF CON 30 Retail Village. So I'm excited that everyone here is interested in that. And again, feel free to ask me uh, any questions. So here's a photo. This was actually a couple of weeks ago. That is, in fact, the same ATM that we will be talking about today. And it, in fact, was out of order. I almost was tempted to offer them a fix, but um, I, I thought better of it. So the background of this event the, and why we got so many ATMs and why we had to do this was the, comp the ironically enough, the event was the collegiate pen testing competition, and it was a prehistoric bank. And of course, we got prehistoric ATMs. These are circa 2000 to 2004. Um, and then there was an EMV update in around 2010. I guess that's still a lot more modern than some may expect, but they're they're fairly old by ATM standards. And so the simulated bank had a lot of custom applications. We had custom tools and everything built to simulate uh, custom software and what a real world pen test would be like. And the students are required to write a report on their findings. Um, in previous years, some of the event um, well, at least the past three or four years, um, teams have found um, O-Days on uh, the software that we use. It's not that the software is custom in, in those particular cases. It's actually off the shelf, and we did not know there were vulnerabilities. But because of the pen test that the students are performing, they find vulnerabilities. It's actually very exciting. We look forward to those findings every year. And so far, the teams have not disappointed us. Um, it's a really cool competition, and if you're like, oh my gosh, I don't think I can find uh, zero days, oh days, sorry, um, however you want to say it, uh, don't worry, the competition is meant, f it goes through a regional qualifying and, and several rounds. Uh, it, it, we want it to be fun. So not every team finds vulnerabilities like that, but the key thing is it's a very interesting competition. We try to make it as realistic as possible. But you're probably wondering, how did you get ATMs? Well, it turns out you can buy anything on eBay and sometimes in great numbers. Turns out you can get an entire truckload of ATMs for maybe less than $500. And maybe you uh, have to get that from uh, one state to another and travel over a thousand miles. You know, just things. Uh, and the good news is it the Mission Impossible for ATMs was a success. The truck almost flipped once and it was it was a journey but um, purchasing atms it's it's a very strange world people are no questions asked and they expect you to just deliver an atm or get an atm and buy it and and take it away so it's it's interesting and all of these were from various locations in fact a lot of the atms as we were analyzing the um the configurations were from waffle houses so um some of them actually were sticky some one at at least had some dead critters in it. They, they were pretty disgusting. Um, but as it turns out, again, you, you can pretty much buy anything. This is the current listing. The bottom one is a single one for $300. We did much better than that. But you can see all the different variants of the um, ATM machines and parts. So here are all the ATM machines running in unison. I don't think that the audio will come through, and in fact, the video footage is pretty, pretty broken. But um, that was all the ATMs and doing their boot up. So, unfortunately, the uh, videos probably won't work t uh, today. Um, so anyway, the the problem with the ATMs was they were in bad shape. They were they were falling apart and we needed to find a way to communicate them. So first we found the working ones, and then we had to figure out what to do. So it turned out there were a few things, not just one thing. And so we tried to find the user manual. Of course, the user manual is meant for users and not people trying to make the ATMs work. Most of the time you go through a 
trusted vendor to buy your ATM and get a actual service for the pay uh, processing, payment processing. And our goal was to make them work. That was the most simple goal of them. We weren't trying to reverse engineer a protocol at the time. We just wanted to see what can we do? Can we make them dispense money? Can we do anything? Of course, it says out of order unless you do the correct sequence for the protocol. And so we were running into some issues. And our final goal was to make it as realistic as possible. We didn't have any defined goals. We didn't have anything other than make them work. So our one item was, was where we started. Of course, the ATM itself is a uh, Tranax Minibank 1500. Um, Hayusung is the brand who took that over, as far as I know, or one of them bought the other. Uh, so you see various names of those interchangeably. And some models actually support up to Windows CE 6.0 with EMV support. Now, Windows CE 6.0 end of life took place in February 2022. So I guess it was fairly modern until recently, but it is what it is. And the, the main problem, though, was that was released in about 2014, and they don't receive any updates since. And with that upgrade, you'd be switching between the current protocol we use and Ethernet, if you so desired. However, in our particular case, the ATM did not have Ethernet. It supported 56 baud modem, and um, it, that was it. And there was a safe. Fun fact, if you can get that door open on the bottom where the uh, money dispenser comes out, most of these ATMs are actually programmed for code 1234 or 000. zero. Um, there were a couple where we actually had to um, get the locks um, like they were spin locks, and so we had to actually listen and, and get in that way. But for the most part, the ATMs were um, with a default code, even though these were directly from the uh, the vendor. They said they didn't know the pins, uh, so we ended up Googling, and that was the answer. Google is, is your friend. So specs, it's, it's a pretty old system. It's powered by a 16-bit microcontroller, Main communication mechanism is the dial-up system. The pin pad contains the crypto keys. If you remove the pin pad, it resets, and then nothing works anymore. You have to reset it. Printer controller also uses the same processor and is an independent board. This allows you to update the main board while keeping the dispenser controller and the printer controller the same. Um, all of it's uh, communicating via serial. People have tried to attack the serial protocol, but that was not as interesting for us because that means you have to have physical access to the ATM. And as we all know, once you have physical access, all bets are off. So with enough determination, you could break in. Here's a picture of the classic mainboard from the ATM. You can see the main logic chip right there. There's a real-time clock that actually um, did not work, um, I believe, because these were the ones with the integrated battery, and those go flat after a while. Um, but Either way, didn't quite work. So you can see here uh, where the main board is. This is a different variant. You can see all the connections to the main uh, or the accessories to the main board. And then there's this one little thing. If you take a look with the question mark, that was a soldered on accessory board. We're not quite sure what it did. If you flip the dip switches, it would not boot. Uh, we couldn't find any identifiers. It is a microcontroller, of course, on there, but uh, what it was actually trying to do and how it was connected, we weren't able to fully trace. Um, you can see the FPGA and the memory on board. Uh, overall, fairly simple setup, uh, but uh, this is what powers the ATM. If you want to get the upgrade, the upgrade, you can see the LAN and modem options, and it's now in a metal enclosure. And then it has a new display board and the EMV compatible um, reader. Of course, we didn't have this, and we, we weren't really trying to. We were just trying to get ATMs to work. So we figured EMV would add to the complications. And of course, it did, but it, it does, but we, we didn't deal with that. So how does an ATM work? And if you're new to ATMs, and maybe I'm, you know, or not as familiar, I may be going over these things um, in a basic sense. But again, this is for people who are not familiar with anything. So um, we're going to go to a little bit background quickly. But ATMs are 
usually need to communicate to a payment processor. If you go over a network that can be online or, and whatnot, if you're going over the phone, there's two options. You either have to have a local payment processor that converts the dial-up communication to Ethernet and then off to the actual payment server with more security and whatnot, or you have to connect to a dial-in payment processor. Um, way back in the day, this was known as VisaNet, and we'll be following that again in, in a little bit on the talk. But the uh, we didn't have either. We didn't know where we could obtain a local payment processor. And we had no operating manuals or guides or figuring out how we could connect. The only options we had was to actually pay a service to give us access. And as an academic competition, we don't have a lot of funds. So we, that was off the table. Um, our first thing to look at, can we emulate the payment processor? And of course we did, but we weren't quite sure how. Of course, near the end of the competition, or, or right before the competition, one of the volunteers was able to obtain an actual payment processor. Um, this one is the external for localized payment. Uh, in is the modem and out is ethernet, and it connects to the internet. You can configure it um, using uh, the Ethernet port, and this allows you to communicate to either one or multiple um, phone uh, dial-in ATMs. So <clears throat> in the competition setting, we had a challenge. We had, um, I believe, eight or nine ATMs in use. We needed a way for them all to communicate, and we only had so many Raspberry Pis so, and phone uh, modems. Uh, USB modems. So how do you do that? Well, we ended up buying some PBXs to allow banks of ATMs to communicate to the PBX, which would then con connect to two lines in to the Raspberry Pi. This allowed us to have two simultaneous connections, and then the additional ATMs would be queuing until they were able to uh, dial to the payment processor, each in our case, which was the Raspberry Pi. And then each Raspberry Pi was connected to a central processor which connected to our uh, our simulated um, bank. And then of course the um, the challenge was before all this was set up, how do we communicate? So in my case, I was the develop one of the developers, so I connected to Dev system, which tunneled through the internet to a jump box at uh, I almost said JRWR, but Valsa's house. Um, and then it tunneled to the Raspberry Pi, which then t allowed us to communicate to the ATM. Now, the, the many layers of connection posed a problem because if you killed the um, connection to the Raspberry Pi or the Raspberry Pi crashed, you might still be able to get to the jump box, but the Pi would be dead and you'd have to reboot it. And then the other fun was the modems would lock up and you'd have to physically reset them. So those were quite a few challenges that we had to deal with. And then of course, a few times, the jump box them itself would just die. So the pie was up, but we couldn't reach it. So um, it's, a, it's a bit of a challenge. And then of course, because all the ATMs were on the East Coast and I was on the West Coast, we had to work through the time zone challenges where things were very challenging sometimes when I would be working at 9 p.m. or 8 p.m. and it was almost midnight for also. So that was a, a challenge. Um, but we worked through it and um, we found out a couple of things. Dialing, dial-up is a bit of a lost art. A few years ago, um, there was a CTF at DEF CON that used dial-up modems for people to connect in. I um, thought that was very cool, but it, it's a bit of a dying and lost art because people don't really use this. We had to get used but new, and I say that with quotes, of course, because they were they were pre-used um, PBXs, and we had to find USB modems compatible actually with the Raspberry Pi and Linux. And then, of course, we had to find how to dial into the ATMs or have the ATMs dial. And then, of course, how many free retries and how to get them to communicate uh, was a problem. And of course, the PBXs we got were um, off eBay and they were the wrong frequency, uh, 50 versus 60 Hertz um, to communicate. So we, we had a lot of things going against us to figure out how to get this all working. And for those of you who are familiar with um, dial-up, uh, 
you know, it's, it, it was a learning experience and I'm glad I learned it again. <laughs> it's been a few years, but um, it's something that we're just not familiar with anymore as, as a, a team, because most of the time you're dealing with ethernet or Wi-Fi. So of course, this is the simplified diagram of the payment processor. The payment processor can operate off of a Raspberry Pi or a, a micro router running OpenWort, which connects to the USB modem and then to a PBX. You probably don't need the PBX to directly communicate, but it's a good idea. And then of course you can control in the final version, the one that I've released more recently, um, you can control the um, way the ATM operates from a web interface if you connect over Wi-Fi. This can force the ATM to accept or reject cards, change transaction fees, and of course, um, manipulate the payments in transit. So for example, if a user thinks they're getting $20, you can request $100 out of their bank account. Um, and then the user gets back a, a validation, of course, not quite the correct validation that they expected. Um, so that's the process. Um, the only thing that's interesting for this is it actually checks to make sure that it's a valid card type that it knows. The ATM internally does. So we were trying to find ATM valid um, cards. The only thing that we were able to obtain that wasn't an old credit card because we didn't want to hand them out for the competition was gift cards, Visa prepaid gift cards. So um, those actually were accepted and we were able to use them and uh, read the card data. So of course, we worked um, on weekends and weekdays to get this working. Um, of course, I would start on the weekends at least at 6 a.m. Pacific time, which was about 9 a.m. Eastern. We would spend the whole day over a Discord or voice call. And the end process was um, trying to just get them to communicate. We had two ATMs at once, but only one Raspberry Pi. So what this and because we were working in parallel trying to understand how these worked, we rediscovered time sharing because we would have to split the workload and wait till someone was done dialing in to get everything. And of course, we rediscovered at commands, um, which are very fun. The ATM internally uses at commands, um, as well as at commands are required to ring and hang up the uh, modems. We needed some way to configure the ATMs, of course. And the challenge was we weren't familiar with these ATMs. They have a guide, but it's a general maintenance guide. And the good news is US Robotics still sort of exists, and they have actually some great documentation, as long as you're able to use an old browser, which was not so good. Um, so here are some of the key at commands. Um, plus, 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 which is to command mode. And then A is answer. And then there's A slash, which is, of course, the repeat. Uh, there's the dial. So when you do um, the ATS 0 equals 2, um, it would auto answer. And you needed the proper new lines. Otherwise, it wouldn't communicate right. So that was a lot of fun. So of course, once we got this working, the ATM would dial. It would send a message. And that's it. How do we know what it's sending? In, in this particular case, you can see the, um, the data when we were trying to decode it. And we were seeing a pattern. We were seeing data, but we weren't quite sure what you know it was. So we, we really didn't know. And we tried sending the same string back. Maybe it was you know a handshake. Um, but really, we were only getting a reply from the modem. And, and it's even funnier in a second, uh, because we were trying to make this work. We, we started with Pi Serial, and that wasn't good. We tried screen because we thought maybe it's just in a different encoding. Then we tried Minicom. And then we actually switched to intercept TTY, which is an old program. You compile it, and it outputs a socket that allows you to run two things to the specific serial line. Um, and that allowed us to run our Python code and Minicom to monitor the messages at the same time. Of course, with Balsa, Everything is in PHP. Um, he once described it to me that he is the Jack Sparrow of PHP programming. And and I, I can't disagree. You, you don't know how he ends up with the stuff he does, but it works and it exists. So we tried PHP, but it wasn't quite working. Um, it was impressive how far we got with PHP, considering it's not really meant for serial work. 
but in over overall the um serial was just unreliable we kept seeing messages and we kept seeing them stack so we knew something was going on but we weren't quite sure we saw the patterns and so we switched back to python using the os uh, sockets for um serial we thought maybe it's encoded so we started looking for the patterns and if you're ever doing protocol analysis um it's really a good idea to start breaking down the messages i if you look at some of these screenshots you'll see new lines um but in this case i was looking for patterns we found 94 we found 0 d 0 a and then we found other strings of messages that were grouped together and then it was repeating there were some um, f7s lucky sevens maybe i don't know um, but you can see I, I started highlighting things to try to find a pattern and where things started over you can see because of the sevens we were able to roughly get um, a reset of where the communication started over so it wasn't actually just continuing the same message it was resetting um, you can probably find more patterns than this but that is not necessarily you know needed as long as you can make the structure um, we did have a major oops moment though um, because when you just decode the text to ascii you get ring 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 connect no carrier ring 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 connect no carrier where was this coming from well i will give you a hint it is the modems i guess that's not much of a hint it's more of a just the answer but the unknown part this fff um, and sevens was something interesting we couldn't quite figure out what this was but we figured it was from the atm so when you're looking for patterns you're trying to find especially with unknown protocols Protocols generally follow a structure, even if they're encrypted, there's usually probably some kind of like preamble or repeating pattern. I broke off the, um, the different hex to show you how it looks. And so we were looking for like line level to see if maybe there was a pattern, like you have to go so many highs before a low, um, looking for a start of packet um, by the pattern. Um, this is all logic signaling um so if it's high or it's low um it allows you to really start seeing if maybe there's like a, a sequence you can see with the 077 this of course is is a, a character but you can see there's a distinct pattern and when you divide these by time slots that's how computers are able to process these and process the signal and respond so we were looking for something that a machine might recognize uh, we didn't quite see anything, but um, we kept searching through vendor sites. Um, the good news is the vendors talk about how this supports um, amazing encryption, including DES compliant uh, or triple DES, uh, triple DES um, encryption and Visa certified pin encryption. So uh, don't worry, it's safe. Um, but we were, were trying to find guides and documents and we were um, really struggling. And then we we found a vendor guide and this vendor guide was not the typical vendor guide it was very detailed and it was listed as a draft so that was exciting from the documentation it spoke about how the modem connects it talks about the bit configuration the parity and the way the message must start so these are all ascii control characters stx etx and enq um, and specifically, it also can, spoke about how to configure and reset the ATM. And we are using, I believe, standard three. These EPS link and ST3 link um, are ones that we didn't use. Um, ST standard three is what we used. Um, and uh, so we, from researching and being able to, you know, with the breakthrough of the protocol uh, or the vendor guide, we were able to start figuring out the protocol. So the standard flow request was terminal call. It'll ring. It sends an inquiry. Then we get a request, response, ACK, end of transmission, end of transmission, everyone's happy, disconnect. But how does that work? Well, we knew that from the vendor guide that it's supposed to do an ENQ to start. So we were sending ENQ and it just ignored us. 
But when you start looking online, and it's actually really funny, this was um, a, an old frack article from 1994, and on the other side of this article was an advertisement for DEF CON 2. Um, so 28 years later, the frack article is relevant again. Um, it, was, it was really cool to see that, though. But um, based on VisaNet, it turns out that um, there was the way you trigger it is you send ENQ, 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 which would trigger the ATM to respond. Good, you know, little tidbit. This was not documented anywhere else. And so once we found this, we were able to get a message. So this is the message we were seeing. And we were so excited, we got a message back. It's funny actually because I'm looking at this message and I can see where the different protocol structure is um, for the different payment parts and, and things like that that it's, it's trying to do for the setup. Um, but uh, this was the message we got back and we didn't see any NQ back, we didn't see an ETX, we didn't see a NAC. So what happened? It doesn't seem to match this at all. And well, we were a little concerned we started looking at the manual again and it says that it can operate either in a batch mode where it queues up all the transactions and then sends them all at once so if someone wants to do a withdrawal deposit and things like that it'll queue them up until they're ready to do a single transmission and send it over or it can do single mode which every transition transaction is a dial in and request we tried both concerned that maybe we had accidentally got it into batch mode um, but um, the batch mode was unlikely because it requires a keep alive connection with the payment process. So it dials in and it keeps sending messages back and forth. We didn't want to handle that. So we went with the simpler single option. So we were trying to figure out what's going on. We started doing parity bits and it's a challenge. Uh, we were not familiar with the, the raw um, parity bits um, because we, we don't really have to deal with it much. So we were able to identify some characters and find valid stuff, but we weren't sure what was going on. We tried shifting over and you can see when you shift a message over, some of the stuff rolls off and it's you, you, you can restructure the message. Um, but that didn't help. So it wasn't just a pure shift. Um, but the question was why would sending a valid ENQ return a response, but not the invalid one that we were getting back. Well, it turns out with classic protocols at classic ASCII, the um, only six of the bits are used. The seventh bit is the parity bit. Um, the parity bit um, is allowing it so that you can uh, make sure that a message comes through correctly. And um, so in our case, we were actually we were able to strip the parity bit and get the correct ASCII code. Um, usually, the seventh bit, the the eighth bit, actually, I'm sorry, um, is uh, is not used nowadays. It's it's just static, but um, it can be used. And so that was how we were um, getting messed up because it was error detection, um, even or odd it would either get turned or off, on or off. So we were seeing some valid characters and some not. So now we were getting an actual message back where we could actually see the ASCII control characters. And of course, that was a challenge because we weren't sure um, what was going on. Um, we, we got these messages back, but we were like, huh, there's some blank parts and things like that. We were trying to empty out certain fields to see what we were doing. Um, I have actually transcoded this into things that it is. This is the terminal ID. This is a field separator, field separator, the um, transaction code. And um, so we were able to start building up like what was what by editing the ATM configuration to send out specific messages. Um, of course, things still didn't work. There was a LRC at the end for parity. Um, it was trying to make sure that the, the messages were good. It's essentially like a CRC or a, a validation bit. Um, and we, uh, I got a bad um, implementation <laughs> uh, that I'd used to implement. And it, it was overly complex and didn't work. So we were sending the wrong uh, LRC. What we ended up doing was, um, and uh, going and finding another reference uh, guide to make sure we were correct. And uh, 
there's a couple of ways you can do this. If the field is small, you can make a table, um, a lookup table to make sure that you have all the values uh, based on a, a specific calculation, or you can do um, what in this case, uh, and that would be like CRC. Um, and in this case, um, it's it's even simpler. It's just bitmath. And so we were able to get everything out with that. And um, once we got this, we would, in the, with the invalid one, we'd get a NAC. And once we sent the valid one with the message, we got an ACK. So that was a nice, um, nice progress. So how does it work? Now we're talking to the ATM, and that's really exciting. Well, the ATM does a host download table request. This request gives the ATM everything it needs, um, including encryption keys, charge amount, and um, a few other values. Um, it supports up to triple DES with um, left and right key combos um, so you could do multiple hosts so not everyone knows the whole key um, it's a 64-bit key however what we found is you can also just send it to all zeros which is great and so when the atm loads this up everything is just just zeros and it's like okay cool um, and that makes it really easy to decrypt um, there is a actual standard um, the um, ANSI standard uh, for pin management and security, um, x.9.8. Um, and it actually is where this comes from, uh, that the pin codes will be 64 bits in length, um, each nibble being stored as an ASCII value, um, 0 through 9, A through F, um, as a, a hex uh, representing the hex characters um, left to right. So that was interesting. That was actually a well-documented piece. You can actually see it here. This is the protocol handler that um, we wrote. And you can see the messages and sending messages back. Uh, it was actually a very basic message handler. And you can see below um, the field separate terminal ID, code, encryption, field separator. Um, and so this is all the messages, the data, and breaking it off. Um, and where we would have like dangling bits and bytes. So um, we were dealing with uh, the uh, extra characters and trying to find the replies. And we would always get either a success or a failure. And um, that allowed us to keep moving forward because it was very simple in response. Did it work? Nope. OK, let's keep trying. So that, that was helpful. Um, you can see at the end, um, we got the uh, ASCII character, um, the control character. So, but it was still sending a failure. So we also needed to send a second message. Uh, after the host download, we needed to send the host totals, which gives the ATM the information about the date, the time, the fees, and a few other fields. But because we were having to handle these uh, messages afterward, um, we realized that we have to build a, a, a state machine. So. State machines, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, um, are a very fundamental of computer science and, and building. Um, it allows you to build essentially code that works through a flow and allows us to take steps to go either go back to the beginning, reset, or um, follow specific conditions. Um, and it allows us to scale with new protocols and messages and uh, see what's going on. So from the start, we receive either nothing or we get um, a, a clear parity bit, and then complete the handshake, um, start the timer. Uh, if the, everything does not succeed within 30 seconds, reset back to here and wait for a message. Uh, if it's success or failure, failure, you stop and the message send a failure. Um, with success, uh, we, we have a few things that we have to check for for the messages. And then uh, the message, uh, type, we can send it off, um, see what it is, and then send it to our payment processor. The original code looks something like this, where we are hand uh, constructing the message and looking for the parity to make sure everything worked. And um, <laughs> I, I do love the comment at the beginning, encryption key should be changed from static at some point. Probably a good idea. Um, but uh, from that big block of text to something very simple, where it just is process message, um, if everything works, send it to the handler and get the handler's response. Um, very much cleaner 
And it allows us to do things like this, where we can see unknown messages, unknown parts, process the messages. And you can actually see here in this message the um, components that actually make up the terminal ID, transaction code, the amount, the pin block, and then all the other data um, that is associated. And so then we can send it back. So once you get an ATM working, you you know you need to get everything working because it's it's out of service. So once we were able to get um, this, the ATMs um, in service, um, we started working on a protocol to allow the ATMs to communicate to us in a meaningful manner. So this one is the first successful message that we had. Um, and you will see in a second that it actually, it, I don't know if you can hear it dialing, but um, it, it makes the uh, actual dial-up noises and then thinks for a second. And then now it's going to spit out the money. And so that was our first successful mes uh, message through. The problem was, again, we were on a budget. This is not real money. This is play money. Um, and the ATMs are designed for a specific fabric type and weight. So it was shredding all our fake money. Um, and we found out that Jamaican currency is the perfect format for um, emulating real money because it's very cheap, for us at least, and um, it doesn't get shredded. So the end result was we support and we built out support, I should say, for over 20 different transaction types. Um, we actually wrote 10 types. Um, and then there's six. Um, and then there's success messages, failure messages, error, where we had special response handlers for those. Um, we only read one track um, on a two-track card. Uh, usually there's two tracks, one with the card number and then some name information. Only track one is read. That's not a feature of us. We can't read the second track, really. Um, it only um, is um, coming through with the ATM. Um, so we, we only can read what it provides. Uh, the hard part was actual padding. It's a zero padded number, so you have uh, three sets of pairs of zeros, so six in total, and you have to move it over to either get cents, dollars, or a larger amount. Um, when you don't pad it correctly, um, this was all static when this was done. Um, you get um, you can either get negative numbers or um, sense so this was a, a ledger balance of a negative amount because you input all these values each one of these is a field back from the payment processor it's not actually necessarily counted in the atm well the fees are counted in the atm but everything else like ledger balance dispense requested uh fee um those those are all responded back as the um, atm so here's a successful run uh, this was actually at the competition so I'm going to mute it because nobody can hear that. Um, so she successfully did the the enter to send the message, and then you could see it where it took a second and the screen updated and the money came out. So at the end of this, what we want to do is switch gears a little bit um, and ask ourselves why are you know 16 to 20 year old ATMs still in use? Why is the protocol still the same way? Um, I know we're going to EMV on a lot of these, and that's a much better protocol. But as you were seeing at the beginning, it's still Windows CE 6, which is end of life. Those ATMs are still going to be in use for many years. Um, and it is an expensive upgrade at that. So um, you know, it's something to think about that these ATMs are still out there and that people are putting their banking details into these systems. Uh, you know, there's there is some security, but Triple Des is is not exactly known in, <laughs> at DEF CON for being particularly good, let alone anywhere else. So, you know, we, we really need to think about that. And when designing protocols, yeah, these were designed in the late 90s, early 2000s, but we need to be making security first fo focused protocols for especially banking systems. Um, and we don't. You know, there's there's modern stuff. Let's use it. Maybe at least HTTP uh, in, instead of uh, unencrypted dial-up. Not much better, but there's HTTPS. There's WebSocket, which should be used um, and can be used. And um, 
make but most of all make the modules upgradable and cheap because at the end of the day if you give someone an easy way to upgrade their components they will and they will use the security that is provided to them most people are not security experts so that that would be a good point of uh, starting anyway i'm happy to answer questions i will be wandering around the uh, village um maybe waving uh, at this point. If not, um, you can find both of us on Twitter, you can ask there, and you can download the ATM processor firmware yourself. Uh, it uses Open Word build, uh, Image Builder to um, build a custom image. Uh, all the code is based on in Python, so you can uh, get that working. It has the web interface, and you can go from there if you happen to have uh, the specific ATM or series of ATMs. So with that, if there's any questions, uh, feel free to ask me, and then um, if not, contact us. Alrighty, thank you.